This is Ari Koretsky and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. And we are back with the second installment in our Israel podcast tour series and specifically in our mini-series highlighting pioneers and champions in the field of special needs and disabilities inclusion. This week, an amazing treat after last week's amazing treat, Daron Almog, the great retired military general. This week, we feature Kalman Samuels, who along with his wife, Malki, has built perhaps the most impressive edifice and enterprise dealing with special needs families in the country, maybe in the world, an incredible building, an incredible organization. Um, just a quick note about this week's recording, a little bit of echo. We were in a large room within the large building, and uh, so a little bit of reverb there, but very well worth hearing every word that Kalman shares as his words and his deeds have echoed, pardon the pun, into the lives of thousands of children and their families over the decades to which he has been committed to this sacred cause. Shalva Director, Kalman Samuels. We are here at the palatial Shalva Center in Jerusalem with Shalva founder, Kalman Samuels. How are you, Kalman? Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I have to say, rarely do I come into an interview so profoundly inspired. Uh, I think this was maybe the shock of my trip. Uh, I, I was expecting to come into a, an office or you know, some kind of a, a service agency, and instead I encountered one of the most magnificent buildings in Jerusalem, but really in the world. It's an amazing, amazing structure. I've just had a, uh, a brief tour of some of its highlights, um, and this is really an incredible, incredible edifice and, and place, so I, I'd love to hear all about it and how this came to be and what happens here and all of that. But let's start from the top uh, and tell us a little bit about where you're from and, and what your upbringing was. Thank you. I'm originally from Vancouver, Canada, from a, a non-observant Jewish family. Canucks fan, or? We were Canucks, but I hate to tell you, the Canucks became an NHL team after I left. Oh, I okay. So we had a farm team called the Canucks, but it was exciting, if that's all you have. And my name on my passport is still Kerry, K-E-R-R-Y. And everyone thought I was a little Irish kid, but I happened to be Jewish. <laughs> and I happened to be a very good jock, athlete in a lot of sports, Canadian Little League All-Star catcher, and uh, captain of the tennis team in high school, captain of the basketball team, scholarship to university. Mind you, it was the local university. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't uh, you know, Duke. It wasn't Kentucky or Duke, yeah. No. But nevertheless, so I went to one year of university in Vancouver, studied philosophy and math, and thought to make my undergraduate year is a process of learning Western civilization. And um, the summer of 1970, after first year university, I was on my way to France to study French and be a good Canadian and speak proper French so that you had a chance of being a, a somebody in the climate that existed in Canada at that time. And my mother asked me to visit Israel for two weeks to visit some distant family we had there. And I told her, sorry, but it's a, an apartheid state. Uh, Even back then, that was your answer. 1970. Sense. Interesting. Uh, that was the readings on campus. That was the statements on campus. And I came from a community where, in spite of that, we were not observant. We still attended the Orthodox synagogue on high holidays. So I didn't come as someone who wasn't affiliated. And nevertheless, that was my understanding. So I gave in. And I spent a couple of weeks in London, came to Israel, had a great time here, was on the beach in Eilat, and um, within two weeks I had had a, something that impacted my thinking in a, in a real way that made me decide that I'm putting France off. And I thought to put it off for six weeks, and then I put it off till the end of the summer, and I began to study Jewish sources. Well, what do you think captured you? What kind of grabbed you in those, in those short I met, days? I met somebody 
who introduced me to a rabbi, and I was all too open to meeting people. And this rabbi happened to run the English program in Kfar Chabad, hmm. and he was a, a brilliant man, and a, we spoke about a lot of things, and when I questioned him on something, he said, he said, trust me, I know, I grew up a Roman Catholic. And this guy had a beard and a mustache that you looked at him and you thought this man was, you know, always generations. Straight from Sinai. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he probably was. He was just looking on. <laughs> uh, but the bottom line is that what I realized is that in my search to understand Western civilization, it starts within Western civilization with the Jewish base. And something that I had been ignoring, and I recognized that this is my civilization, this is my primary culture, and let me get a handle on that for the summer, and then I'll move on and have a better understanding of Western civilization that in so many ways emanates from, you know, Jewish values. Did, uh, you, did you have difficulty confronting the political uh, concerns that you had, or did those kind of evaporate? They, those, those never existed. It was just a party line. You know, I came here, had a great time, and you forget all those things. Very <laughs> all of a sudden, important. part time is not so uh, pressing. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so I began to study in Kfar Chabad, and that became a bit much for me. And uh, towards the end of the summer, I decided I'm going to spend a year. And my dear father freaked out. Uh, he's a lawyer; was a lawyer, and you know, I understand him only too well <laughs> that he thought the Moonies had him, had me and come back to university, you'll study second year, we'll, you'll have all the ability to study as well. And I made a decision, I'm gonna, while I'm here, I'm going to take the year and really figure this out. So I moved to another yeshiva headed by a young man named Rabbi Chaim Bravender called Hartman College, a young 29-year-old dynamic individual. Yeah. And there was already more acceptable to my parents because it was called Hartman College. Right. And uh, the people who were there were largely academics. All this is academics. before he, before Bra Bravinders, before Hamiftar, and all of that. Yes, this is the original, you know, uh, place. And um, I studied there, studied elsewhere. After about another year and a half, I said to myself, if I was in India, I wouldn't be hanging out with Anglo's. I would go see the the real ashram. So let me go see the local Jewish ashram. So, for whatever reason, I took a college textbook in Yiddish, I learned Yiddish, I enrolled myself in a B'nai Brak yeshiva, Hasidic yeshiva, huh. called Chu Chasam Soifa, and everything was in Yiddish, and yours truly sort of went off further off the deep end, became Hasidic, and uh, loved every moment of it, you know, day in and day out, just delving into the things that really mentally stimulated me in terms of Talmud, which I had never found something that so challenged me on an intellectual basis, uh, the logic, and of course all the other studies that go with it that just enabled me to feel very, very meaningful. And um, ultimately I studied towards getting a rabbinical degree, met my wife Malki, married, and our second child Yossi, who's today 41, at the age of 11 months, a beautiful, healthy baby. Uh, Malki took him for a triple vaccine to the public health center here in Jerusalem. And unbeknown to us and unbeknown to the public, the Ministry of Health was having a problem with a couple of batches of vaccines, and many children were injured. Six weeks after Yossi had his, and he had a horrific reaction immediately, and he became blind and deaf. Six weeks after that, the government went public in all the papers that, yes, we've had a problem, but not to worry, we're getting a new batch of vaccine from another country, and it'll be just fine. For Yossi, it was no longer just fine. For us, life had been flipped on its head, and we uh, looked for how to help Yossi. Uh, well, well, this time, what were you doing in your life? In other words, were you still studying or were you looking to go out to work at in that some capacity? Time, at that time, I was still studying. I had become a scribe, I had become a cipher, but my life was entirely involved in the world of study. And when this happened, that was a wake-up call. I realized very quickly 
that those days are gone. I'm going to have to do something in order to take care of my son, and that's going to demand money, and that's going to don't have the luxury of ignoring that. So uh, one of the things, and I went into the computer field, did very well, and ultimately worked for 18 years running what's called the United States Israel Binational Science Foundation in terms of the computer operations, uh, and that's what I did professionally. Did the government ever um, acknowledge, it sounds like they did acknowledge culpability. Was there any response uh, financially or in terms of, in the U.S., you know, a Jew in the U.S. would be suing, <laughs> you know, like from here till the end of time. How does was, it work in Israel? Was that an anti-Semitic statement? <laughs> Take it as it is. <laughs> just, just a statement of fact. Other, other citizens don't sue. They certainly Everybody do. Everybody sues. <laughs> when you're faced with a problem, believe yeah. me, you, you look for someone. Um, yes, the government accepted responsibility ultimately, after many years, for 12 children. That did not include my son Yossi. Well-meaning people asked my wife, or suggested, teachers, you know, of different kinds, Malki, you have a young family, it's growing, you cannot raise your family in this atmosphere where one of your children is into everything, doesn't hear, doesn't see, is pushing his hands, and it, it was challenging beyond belief. Uh, but Malki used to say to them, you know, thank you very much, but this is my child, God has given him to me, and this is the child I'm going to raise. What would they have suggested you do? Place him in like an orphanage? or Place something? him outside the home. What they yeah. did, I don't know that they had concrete suggestions, right. but the, the gist of their suggestions was to get him out of the house. And Malki used to cry at night and say, God, I'm never putting Yossi out of the house, but if you ever decide to help my Yossi, I'm going to dedicate my life to helping other people mothers with their problems. And seven years later in the deaf school, he was eight, and a deaf teacher in the deaf school put one of his palms, he looked like he was five, put one of his palms on a table, and the other palm she spelled inside it five symbols for five Hebrew letters for the word table, shulchan, and someone invented symbols, and it was a shin, and a vav, and a lamed, and a chet, and a nun, and over and over, for several days, she just spelled these symbols into the palm of his hand. At some point, he lit up, and she recognized that he had just got communication. And I always say that was the miracle that she recognized. It, it could have slipped. And as she said, that was his Helen Keller moment. Same age, hers was water, his was shulchan, table. And on the basis of his breakthrough, she taught him the 22 letters of the Hebrew ABC, the Aleph Bet. And another extraordinary speech therapist worked with him for two years and taught him how to speak Hebrew. Spoke synthetically, but he spoke Hebrew. And all of a sudden you have a child who you have input in the palm of his hand, and you have output through his speech. He turned out to be brilliant. He turned out to be, as they say, like a wonder child. And the president of Israel at that time, President Chaim Herzog, of blessed memory, visited him. Uh, Israel's version of 60 Minutes did a segment on Yossi, and before those events, immediately upon the breakthrough, Malki turned to me, sat me down, and said, it's payback time. I know exactly what I want to do to give back, and I need your help. It took me three years to find someone who would help us uh, get started, and a dear friend of mine in Vancouver, Canada, Gordon Diamond and his dear wife Leslie helped us get started. We rented a small apartment. We had five kids and one after school program. Malki was the driver, she was the cook. We had two professional staff, a couple of volunteers, and we thought that was great shakes. It was overwhelming. And These I, were all kids who were blind and deaf? Or what no, was? absolutely not blind and deaf. These are all kids with some kind of cognitive disability. It could have been downs, it could have been uh, on the spectrum, mm -hmm. whatever it was. Uh, they were absolutely not blind and not deaf. Yossi never took part in Shalva programs. He was very busy in the deaf school, in the afternoon in the blind school programs till 6 p.m. So we had no need for Shalva for Yossi per se, but he was absolutely the inspiration be behind its establishment. Uh, and I always say God has a sense of humor. For whatever reason, it began to grow in leaps and in bounds. I mean, we touched on something very needed, and we can go into the programs in a minute, but just to fast forward 28 years, 
we have built a beautiful center in the 90s, finished it in the late 90s, serviced us up until two years ago. The government gave us seven acres of land uh, 10 years ago, upon which we built and completed the largest center, certainly in Israel, may well be the largest in the world for kids with disabilities, 220,000 square feet, and every inch of it is beautifully done and intimate, so it's never institutional. And we service a thousand children a day from birth with their mothers who bring them in, all the way up to adulthood. And we now also opened our first uh, inclusive apartment for adults in the community. How did you know early on even what to do? In other words, it's an interesting shift that your wife had saying, I'm going to help kids with cognitive disabilities. That wasn't necessarily Yossi's challenge. How did she choose to do that in particular, and how did you learn about these things? Okay, a very astute question, and Malki is a very interesting individual. She's behind the scenes. You won't see her in public very much. Uh, I mean, she's not that she's behind the scenes, but she's not outside talking about these things. Malki had a sense. As she once said when I asked her, she says, Kalman, I have great respect for professionals and I understand the need. And today with 400 staff on my staff uh, and a budget of $12 million, a full 67% of that budget goes to professionals, paying staff to care for the kids. So we have a deep appreciation of what a professional can do. But in answer to your question, she said, professionals built the Titanic, amateurs built Noah's Ark. <laughs> that sometimes, clever, sometimes yeah. you know, you don't have to be the great expert right. to be able to do something good. So the program she built one by one, and it was a mother's response to the gaps that she felt in programming. Mm -hmm. First thing was after school. Yossi came home and as he was a child at one o'clock, two o'clock from the deaf school. His day was over at that point. And Malki had to take care of that child. And your day, somebody cannot work. Somebody's got to be there for the child, obviously. Uh, she wanted families to be able to work, to be able to study, for the siblings to be able to come home and see mommy and daddy without any distraction, to be able to do homework. So in order to do that, she took the Israeli work week from Sunday to Thursday and created an after-school program where kids came directly from school, from their school buses, get dropped off at our center, and had a ball, had like camp activities, and a hot meal, and they were bused home, Malki was the bus driver, and drove our van home in, in the initial days, and uh, they didn't get home till 6.30. So all of a sudden, mommy and daddy have the ability to have a quality life, just like anybody else, and the child has a great day, and when he arrives home, mommy and daddy and the siblings can hopefully receive him with the love he needs. That was the first program. Out of that, Malki said to me one day, we need a program overnight, and I want to take a subset of the kids. Initially, it was one room in our center, which was two apartments in those days, eight children, and uh, every night a different eight, Sunday through Thursday. And what that meant, if today is, for example, Sunday, the child goes to school, which the government pays for for special education Sunday morning, comes to Shalv in the afternoon, if it's his night, which it is every week, sleeps Sunday night with his buddies, and he knows who he's sleeping with, he knows the staff, the staff knows him. It's very different than a respite center where you drop the child off once a year and nobody knows anybody. Uh, and it's the a weekly sleepover, basically. Exactly, exactly what it <laughs> every is. Every kid's dream. But the parents have from Sunday morning till Monday night. So those two functional days in the middle of the week are an enormous, enormous gift that I can't say enough about. And if there's one program amongst the many that Shalva operates today that I would have wished for when Yossi was small, it would be that program. Just to have a break and a, a bre some breathing space. Totally. Yeah. It's incessant pressure that never stops. And if you give a family that space, you've just created quality of life yeah. between the after school and the once a week, two day break. I mean, you're home free. I would imagine parents like schedule around that and make other doctor's appointments and things they need to do that they can't 
Totally. Go and, to it's do. Not, and it's not over a Shabbat, it's not over a weekend. Right. It's in a functional week where you can actually schedule these things. Go to the DMV or whatever you need to do. Whatever, or take a course in something you've always dreamed of and you can't take it. Right. Um, so that was the second program. Then Melky sat me down 18 years ago that she needs another program for mothers who just gave birth to a baby with a disability. Mommy's blown out of the water. And as Malki said, Humpty Dumpty can't be put together again by professionals, only by other mothers. The problem is not medical. Everyone has a medical problem, of course. The problem is social. The loneliness kills. You're sitting home alone with your child. You're not getting out. And it's a horrifically challenging thing that she went through. And she wanted mothers to have each other. So we set up a Me and My Mummy program where again, each day of the five-day week, a different set of mothers came in. So they really bond as a group. But each day, different mothers. Right. They bond as a group. They get five therapies a day, speech, physio, occupational. We had a pool. We still have a beautiful pool. Swimming in the pool where they bond for the first time with their baby. And half an hour in the middle, where staff backs off, <coughs> and they have coffee, cake, an opportunity to create community and to see that, hey, I'm not alone. This mother has similar but different problems. Right. And it just, within a matter of weeks, begins to empower that mother, and she begins to feel that, hey, I can do this. And the therapies are not about only helping the child. The therapies are about involving the mother and getting her hands on so that she begins to understand and interact with her child. Mm, parent education, sure. And it's, but it's, it's an empowerment that within six to eight weeks they're just totally different human beings. It's called me and my mummy in spite of the fact that daddy also comes very often because our belief is that if mummy is functioning, that family will make it. And if mummy's not functioning, chances are that family, in spite of all the therapy, probably won't stay together and won't make it. So that's the third program. That goes from birth to one and a half. Out of me and my mummy, a natural response to the demand from parents was to create an extension after the child was a year and a half old. And that was a rehabilitative daycare center, which is a government operated center, which we run, but it's overseen by the government. Uh, and out of that, grew a preschool. So today, between the me and my mommy, the daycare, and the preschool, our preschool programs go up to six years of age, and we have 250 youngsters in those programs. What's unique about our programs is that we have, independent of the kids who've always attended, three classes of parallel classes of children who are normative, healthy youngsters. And we have, for example, let's say it's a four-year-old class. We have a parallel class of four-year-olds who are going to a regular preschool. They get all their ABCs and academics in their class. But except for that core academics, the activities are all done together. So you have inclusion where you have everything that goes into inclusion other than the hardcore of education and learning in which the kids who are normative are going to learn at a different level and a different skill set than those kids with disabilities. It's an amazing model and it's being studied and you have to have space to do that and we have that space and the nice thing is is the parents, everything at Shalva since its inception has always been first come, first serve. It's also been free of charge. No one has ever been turned away because of funding. The only program at Shalva that people pay for is the typical normative preschool. But they'd be paying anyway for a preschool, right? True, but they kill to get in because they understand that these children are going to be exposed to a world that they won't get in a typical preschool and there's always going to be enormous number of therapists in the vicinity that if the child has a small problem I mean, even in the normative class they can be they seen still might have a speech issue or something absolutely absolutely so uh, those are the key programs uh, we have a sports center that has a gym with basketball with soccer we have a judo program 
Um, our auditorium has 340 seats and the kids perform there and use it for their needs. But one of the key things we built in this center is what's called reverse inclusion. Reverse inclusion is a concept as opposed to putting several children with disabilities in a larger class, a, which is wonderful, but it's limited in its scope. We have created a center where the general public wants to be here. We have probably one of the best Italian cafes in the center where people come not to see the kids. Just to eat. They come because it's one of the best cafes in the city. <laughs> And the nice thing about the cafe is it's a social cafe where some of the employees have disabilities. So they're exposed to kids with disabilities, they have an amazing meal, and they continue to come back. They rent out the auditorium, whether it be for a corporate conference or educational, government, and it's in you know constant use. Uh, so that brings us income. but. It has brought us in the last two years since we opened over 200,000 individuals into this building for their own reasons. So it becomes very much sort of a community center and a, a mesh where people come in for all reasons. They begin to feel comfortable whether they did it at the beginning or they don't. The kids are in, the kids right. are out, the kids see them. They, it's an extraordinary... Kind of a soft sort of osmosis approach to... Just normalizing these Absolutely. These issues. And it becomes normal. Yeah. It's incredible to see it. Uh, and so the cafe caters these events. We have bar bat mitzvahs. We have people. We have a magnificent synagogue. People actually want to make their, their Brit here, their child, and then they cater the event. We have a beautiful hall for, the, for that. So it becomes very much a community center. And whereas everybody understands that the reason for building a community center in any community is to provide that community with a quality of life. You want to have a place where people can go to swim, to go to a gym, to have a cup of coffee, to be seen, to see, and just feel part of the community education. It's interesting that when it comes to people with families with disabilities, some people look and sort of say, well, why? And the answer is very simple, that somehow when a mother gives birth to a child she wasn't expecting, and the child has a disability of one kind or another, sometimes people feel, well, that mother has also given up her right to a quality of life. Why would she and her child need the big community center that my child needs? And I know people don't say that. But I believe it's something that's in the back of people's minds sometimes. I'm questioned about it occasionally, about why such a beautiful place. And the reason is because it's a statement. It's a statement that these mothers, these fathers, these families are absolutely entitled and worthy of a quality of life that works for them, just as any typical person does. Take me back to, I guess it was around 1980, right, when this was all, uh, when you were starting these programs. 1990. 90s when you started the programs initially? 28 years ago. The after school programs and everything in 1990. So what was the state of inclusion of uh, disabilities, awareness and things like that in Israel generally? Were you entering sort of a barren wasteland of, you know, of, and, and, and a culture of ignorance and so forth? Or were there other kind of programs that existed in different parts of the city or even the country? There were wonderful programs, people trying very hard but it was light years away from where we are today. 28 years down the road, it's a much more enlightened community, and it's not that people weren't trying, it's that things have really changed. Uh, you know, the word inclusion has become not just a, you know, a, by, a byword. Inclusion is great efforts have been made in the broader community, and it's, it's happening in, in so many ways. People. I believe there's still an apprehension in large sectors of the community with people with disabilities. There's, you know, that's without any denial. But I would say there's a long way to go, but we've come a very long ways. Initially, we were, I would say, the first decade, almost mocked for talking so much about family as, as opposed to the, the therapy. The kids. And I used to always say that. Therapy is very important and we give therapy. 
but if the family's not functioning, therapy's of very little value. Therapy's an hour a week, an hour a day, but... You gotta live. And yeah. over time, it was very funny, in 2005, 15 years after we opened, my director of education came running, crying almost to me, saying, you're not gonna believe this, but the certain ministry of the government that relates to these issues right. had lifted text from our website about family and put it on theirs. <laughs> Maybe they changed a few words. Great validation. And yeah. I said to her, I said, why are you upset? What could be more amazing that the same people who did not understand what we were all about over the first 10 years are now coming to that direction? And that has become the core of all of care for kids with disabilities. It's about family, a holistic about approach. The child within the family, the family within the community. We were there some years earlier and you know it's it's wonderful. It's interesting because the very name of the institution itself, Shalva, is peace or serenity. And that really seems to kind of echo what you were trying to accomplish. Was that a name that you originated early on? Was it an immediate kind of uh, flash of inspiration? Who came up with the name? And Because it really does seem to reflect that idea of not just treatment, but creating an entire environment of serenity for a whole family. Well, you've hit it on the, on the head. When we began Shalva, I was told that we have to have a name. And a lawyer friend of mine told me before the days of internet that he's going to be in the government office for a client trying to check out a name for a company, and if my wife and I can come up with a name till 8.30 the following morning, he'd be happy to check it <laughs> out. file it up. So we sat down, and we went backwards and forwards, and she said, Shalva at some point, and I said, Shalva, that's an Israeli breakfast cereal. It's a very common <laughs> cereal. And she says, no, it's peace of mind. And everything we're doing is a function of trying to bring a family to a situation where they can have peace of mind and a quality of life. So that's how it began, and I do agree with you that it is, it's remained a very, very you know, accurate name for this organization. Over 28 years, it sounds like you and, and, and Malki have become, um, you must have become sort of experts in, in this field. How did that happen? Was it just a function of you know, case by case as you started meeting more and more people, interacting with therapists, or at some point did you look for formal education? Did you start to liaise with experts in this field from around the world, maybe in countries that were perhaps more progressive on these issues at the time? Like, how did you generate your own sense of awareness and education? First, don't forget, we, life is a great teacher. We are parents of Yossi, and the lessons we know and the lessons we try and implement stem from you know, you get a wake-up call, you get hit between the eyes, and you realize life has forever changed, and you have a choice. How exactly do you move forward? So there are those who fall apart. Marriages do fall apart. And, you know, thank God I was blessed with a wife that was very focused, uh, you know, I would say very much somewhat of a bulldozer in the positive sense. And as the Dean of Education of Tel Aviv University, Professor Malki Margalit, who last year won the Israel Prize for Education, oh. and we got to know reasonably early on, uh, said to me once, she said, I could never have set up Shalva. And I said, how's that? Why would you say that? She says, there's two reasons. The first reason is that it required a mother who had experienced the gaps in educational programs and had the smarts to understand how to fill those gaps in a meaningful way. As a professor, I know far more educated, obviously, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I would recognize those gaps the way a mother would recognize it. So that's number one. Malki does have smarts, and she built the programs one after the other, and you know, I've often asked that question to her because Malki was a young woman when I married her and did not go to schools for special ed, nor did she go to schools for architecture, yet she was able to do all these things. The other thing Professor Margalit said, I couldn't have created it because if I came up with this great idea, my superiors would ask, great, how are we going to pay for this? And I would say I have a foundation for the first three years of supporting this program. And they would say, that's wonderful. What are you going to do in year four? 
if I didn't have a, an answer in terms of how am I going to fund this, chances are they would have said, sorry, but you can't start. She said, your wife never had those problems. She had an idiot like you to run around the world doing her bidding and you just try to keep this thing going. So sometimes it's, you know, it works sometimes better by not having uh, all the necessary skills. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that because obviously you started as a rabbinical student, moved to become a computer programmer, um, probably a, a fundraiser of tens of millions of dollars. Um, I think you mentioned this building, which we'll, we'll get to in a few minutes cost $63 million to put up and countless millions annually to maintain and besides all the programs. How did you become that? How did you uh, transform into somebody who is able to do that kind of unbelievable fundraising? Obviously, it's not coming only from within Israel. You're, as you mentioned, schlepping around the world. Um, your original seed donor was in Vancouver, and I saw the wall downstairs with all the names, many of which I recognize, and from all over the world. So how did that process develop for you, and how did you become t to someone who today is raising tens of millions of dollars? The hard way. <laughs> one by one, making every mistake possible. <laughs> and learning from experience. Uh, most of the skills you mention in terms of, first of all, we hire the best professionals we can. We have on As staff, development staff? No, I'm okay. talking about on the professional staff. So that, you know, I, as much as I had oversight and took care of these things, I recognized that I'm not a special ed professional. And we hired, as I say, the best people we could and we continue to do that. So the programs are run without my intervention. Malki was always there to keep people on track, make sure they didn't go off one direction or the other. This is not the vision, this is what we're doing. And while the needs are tremendous in all areas, this is who we are and we want to stick right. to where the direction that we're going. Uh, in terms of the fundraising, um, I can tell you that the first trip I took after one year after Mr. Diamond's money ran out, and I said, I'm gonna to go to New York and I'll get on a plane not knowing anybody. And at the airport, uh, a fellow said to me, Calvin, where are you going? And I said, I just started this organization a year ago and I'm going to New York to try and keep it together. And he says, Calvin, are you nuts? Do you know it's now after the holiday of Sukkot and two thirds of the people on that plane are collectors going to New York? So I said, I guess I got a choice. Either I fold now and go home or I make it. And I go for a week, 10 days, and do what I can. To say I had instant success would be far from reality. But somehow God helped step by step to keep this little thing together, meeting what I call good angels en route, uh, who helped us. And that continues today for 28 years. Today we have a budget of $12 million. Government gives me 37%. And we have some income from our cafe and from the events. But you still but personally have to raise around six million, million dollars. dollars a year. Yeah. So that six million dollars doesn't come in easily and I spend an enormous amount of time doing it. Over the years we created, early on we created American Friends of Shalva, but we have an office in New York City mm -hmm. with four staff mm. and I have a wonderful individual who manages that office. Um, it takes an inordinate amount of my time. Uh, and similarly in Canada, we initially in Vancouver, later in Toronto, we have a British friends, and uh, it's not a huge operation in that regard. We try and keep it very lean, right? but at the same time it's necessary just to make, make management. So to answer your questions, there's been enormous, I have really got no explanation. I come in here every day and I look up and see this 12-story building and the beauty as you mentioned. And I think to myself, God, where did this come from? And it's a sincere feeling. There's people say you must be very proud. And I say pride doesn't enter the equation. It's, to be quite honest, it's being humbled. Tell me about this building. You mentioned a little, you referenced some of it before, and it's a 12-story building. And again, I, just to echo what, how I started, I was just blown away by, and I'm going to put pictures on Facebook and so forth, but the uh, just the sheer, not only scope or vastness of the building that you know there are big buildings around 
but the beauty and the, the, the detail, and I'm not even an aesthetic person really, I'm not an artistically sensitive person by any stretch, and yet even, even a, a Luddite like me can appreciate the incredible, exquisite artistry of the building. Tell me about it, how did it develop, how was it, you know, what are some of the signature features, and, and just how did it come to be? Malki, from day one, has had enormous touch and a vision when it comes to all things um, design, interior design, whether it be in the first apartment, the two joint apartments, whether it be the center that she literally built, it was scheduled to be a 3,000 square foot center that we bought a shell of in a neighborhood called Harnoff in 1995, and Malki just took the mountain apart on our land and built 18,000 square feet. And this was working, we did not have management teams in those days, uh, our Mohammed was our electrician that we knew and he did some construction work for the city we became friends and he and Malki began doing that initial structure later we had other people but that whole building was as people said at Disneyland and everything in that building from the building to the interior design was Malki when we got the land and when we built this building once again Malki worked with the very best architects a, a man named Randy Epstein uh, and she and Randy worked hand in hand literally and as Randy said he never had a client who had so much partnership and input into every phase as she did and Malki doesn't work well with pen and paper necessarily but before this building was ever built she said to me several times the building is finished just bring the gelt what did she mean by the building is finished? In her mind, right. she had every detail of every facet. Everything you see in this building is Malki's touch. Nothing moves here from the tiles to the walls to the colors. She got a lot of flack from a lot of people, including the experts, saying that she's making it too colorful, she's making it kitschy, and all kinds of things have been said. She's making the corridors on the upper floors that are probably five meters wide, too wide, wasting space in the length of the building. Right. And she said this is not a corridor, this is living space, this is a place where people have to feel liberated. And uh, after the fact, the experts sincerely are really amazed by what she created. She should hire herself out and then you'll say it'll cover half your budget. <laughs> She's been asked many times, I, I'll imagine. and her response has always been, in my little shtetl, in my little place that I shalva, I give it my best. I'm not professional, and go hire professionals. Yeah. It's really incredible. What are some of the features that, that abound in this building? It starts 12 floors. You have two floors of parking, underground parking. Uh, you come into the main lobby. It's a 23-foot atrium. Hanging in the lobby, you have a magnificent piece of hanging art uh, by a famous Israeli artist named David Gerstein, which is a, the motif of the building is butterflies. So you have a, a believe I believe a 16 foot uh, butterfly thing that hangs down in the middle. There's a technical word that slips my mind right now. Why butterflies? Butterflies because Malki felt that a butterfly has a tough life early stages in a cocoon, has to break its own way out in order to fly. It cannot be helped by others. It has to do the work by itself. If you try and help it, you'll kill it. And similarly, our children have significant challenges early on, and you cannot do the work for them. You can provide an environment. You can try and provide them with skills. But at the end of the day, you have to motivate those youngsters to fight for themselves. And by doing so, you enable them to fly ultimately to the best of their ability. So it's that thought that is the, as you walk in and throughout the building, it remains the motif. A, the main floor has a lot of things on it, including employment for young adults. A, but if we go down one floor between the parking and the main floor, you have a 23,000 square foot sports center in which you have a full-size, magnificent gymnasium, you have a fitness center, you have two pools, one a very large pool, which is a therapy pool for mothers and babies and younger children to swim, for mothers first to bond with their baby in that pool, 
and it's used from morning to night. You slip to the other side, you come to a semi-Olympic magnificent pool used by about a thousand kids a week. Uh, and that is a tremendous gift. Moving up to the second floor, excuse me, the first floor, you have the cafe I mentioned, which is a f fabulous, fabulous high-end cafe. Dairy? Dairy, managed by a wonderful, wonderful group of people who have another cafe in the city mm. in a place called Beit Zeit. It's very high-end and we approached them while we were in construction. And that's a profit center, right? That's that a is a profit center mm -hmm. and they people flock to it. Uh, and we have three youngsters working there uh, with disabilities as a social enterprise. Uh, on the same floor we have a 340 seat auditorium, which is the, probably one of the finest auditoriums in the city. And full service auditorium, films, uh, productions, our kids use it. And we also rent it out for conferences, for whatever somebody needs it for. It's a source of income for us. The cafe caters all the events in this building. On the other side, on the first floor, you have a very large uh, hall for events, which seats and can house 180 people. So over there, you have, again, meetings that are catered. You may have a bat mitzvah, a bar mitzvah. You mm. may have whatever events go into it. And we have an events staff that are designed and, de uh, and dedicated strictly to managing that element and it's not going to save the day in terms of funding but it, helps. it is a source yeah. of income and equally important it brings in the reverse inclusion right you move up a floor you have an after-school program sitting on 20,000 square feet you have a fabulous music center where the Shalva band plays the Shalva band is made up of eight musicians uh, two of them young blind girls who are extraordinary vocalists, a keyboard guy who has 5% vision in one eye, he's off the charts in terms of his ability, and the band has played all over the world. The band was, this past March, taped by Google and put onto something they call Talks at Google on YouTube, and it's called uh, Ambassadors of Change, the Shalva Band, and it's a one-hour tape, and I would encourage your listeners to go and listen because they will be very, very surprised to hear the quality that they're listening to. And on that same floor, we have a dental clinic, which has got two chairs and is not used to fill cavities, but is used to do oral health. One of the problems facing children with disabilities is that very often mommy and daddy don't have the time and the patience to brush, brush their teeth appropriately and very often the child doesn't have the ability to do it himself. The end result is by the time that kid is six or seven, uh, his, his dental problems are no longer a case of going to a dentist. His dental problems are surgery in a local hospital. So if we can do oral health, if we can give that kid from early on fluoride, cleaning of the teeth. We hired the former pediatric head of dentistry at Hadassah Hospital, Professor Yossi Shapiro, and he and his staff have cleaned, I don't know if it's up to 700 or 800 mouths. When they find problems, they refer them to dentists so that you don't have a situation where you're saving families and those children from endless, endless grief. That's also on that floor, and you have a world of facilities for youngsters who are in wheelchairs, in very challenging situations, all the way up to a bit higher functioning, and they have a blast from the time they walk in, full staff, and they leave after dinner at six o'clock, we bust them home. On the third floor, you have a dining room, it seats 600, it's used every day. You have a magnificent synagogue, which is designed for the kids, and you have the kids using it on days, and also every second Shabbat is an in Shabbat, where we have 70 kids sleeping, 70 staff and volunteers, and those staff and volunteers help the children for them to get called up to the Torah and do the best they can. Um, 
You also have a huge commercial kitchen on that floor. You move up a floor, you have the overnight respite, where you have five separate pods of four bedrooms each, four beds in each bedroom. So you have 86 beds on that floor, which enables us to provide services of respite to different populations at the same time, at the same night. Uh, you move up a floor, you have the Me and My Mummy program, and then you begin the preschool on five, six, and seven. Uh, in the middle, you have a 250 kids in those programs. In the middle, you have an entire floor of systems, whether it's air conditioning and everything mm. else. So all in all, if you count it all up, it's 12 floors. Incredible. And we didn't talk about the parks. <laughs> oh, that's right, we did not. Some beautiful parks outside. We I got to see from the rooftop view, uh, inclusion parks, and tell us briefly about that. The parks are magnificent parks built for children and youngsters with disabilities to be able to use the, the parks with wheelchairs. It's open to the public and the public loves it. You have families and children coming from the local neighborhood from all over the city coming to use those parks and there are thousands and thousands of people a week coming to use it. Our children have full access to it and it's an extraordinary act of inclusion. Unbelievable. Just in starting to, to close, Kalman, can you share one or two stories about a, a child or two that sort of is emblematic of the Shalva experience, um, something that sort of encapsulates what you are trying to accomplish here? Well, one child is today a young girl of 17. When she was very young, I don't know if it was two or three, her family was on vacation in the north of Israel in Kiryat Shmona. They went to a mall and somehow that child fell down the escalator shaft and fell a number of floors, was in a coma, and basically was given up as having not having a chance to live. She survived, she was in a coma for two years, her parents never left her bedside, and after two years she woke up. She had had many surgeries, and she was a severe disabilities. And at the age of about 10, maybe even a bit younger, she came to Shalva in her wheelchair, lying, you know, almost horizontally. And in Shalva, uh, with the music around her, she came back to life. And she now talks to a degree. She understands what is being said to her. She will never go to Harvard. Right. But the progress she has made from where she is, and for the parents, the father had left work, he went back to work, the mother went and became a doula in the hospital, and they have fully functional lives. So there's a situation where that child took them off their feet, the child is extraordinary, and they're extraordinary. On the other hand, we have a beautiful young girl who's now 17, came to us early on, she has a aging disease. Mm. and uh, the family's had a very, very hard time. And she's had care and love here that's inexplicable how much love she generates and how much love she gets. And her lifespan will probably be till the age of 23, 24. You almost see her shrinking in front of your eyes. Mm. So it's a horrifically challenging illness and you see the suffering of the family, the suffering of the child, but this young girl has been to Disneyland in Paris. She's been to Holland. You know, we arrange things with wonderful other people to give this child and her family life. Unbelievable. And finally, I'm just so curious, we started with your son Yossi. I think appropriate to end with him as well. Where is Yossi today? What's, his, uh, what's he up to? Yossi's 41. Yossi can't hear, he can't see. 20 years ago, he began to lose his ability to walk. He went into a wheelchair, and that was a killer for him not to be mobile. And uh, Yossi is someone who never lets his disabilities get in his way. He works. He works at Israel's largest Route 6 toll road. He puts uh, easy passes, three-piece mechanical easy passes together. He does it almost at a rate of a normal person. And when asked as to how that's possible, the boss said to me, well, let's sit back and think a minute. Yossi doesn't 
he has a phone and other people help him use it, but he's not on the phone when he's working. <laughs> when he goes to the bathroom, he clocks out and he clocks back in. He doesn't smoke, so he's not going out to smoke. And he's not talking to anybody. He's just working. So while others do make more, he makes a significant amount. Yossi is a busy boy. Yossi rides horses. Yossi's in the gym. Even though he can't walk, he can go on the tra treadmill. Um, Yossi swims once a week. Uh, Yossi has thousands of people with whom he's in contact, whom he never forgets, whether it's email, whether it's um, text, or what have you. And of course, someone writes those texts for him. He dictates what he wants to write. Uh, Yossi travels with his friends. He was in Greece two months ago, sending home pictures with a cigar and a bottle and a glass of wine. <laughs> Yossi wanted to ride elephants. He was with two buddies in Thailand a couple of years ago, uh, riding elephants in Thailand. Yossi has an incredible sense of smell, and he wanted to um, be a wine taster, which is smell. Mm, sommelier, sure. And he became a sommelier. He's licensed. He's not going to work in the field because he can't communicate well and he can't stand but he's a brilliant guy when it comes to wines and he can help you choose out <laughs> he has a special wines without a doubt so Yossi has an amazingly full life and as he said to me yesterday his goal in life was and remains to bring happiness to others beautiful have your other children gotten involved at all in, in Shalva and how have they been impacted in this whole experience together with him my other children have all grown up with Shalva. It's been absolutely part of their lives from the days they were very young, and their parents have been involved. They've been involved as volunteers in many different ways, and I have two children who are very involved in Shalva. One is Yochanan, one is Avi, and they are basically the passion and the, and the sort of leadership moving forward. The next generation, yeah. The next generation of leadership, but the very, I mean, they're, you know, they're both big professionals in their own right. And so they work here or they work no, in no, separate they fields? Work, they work here. Yochanan is the CEO. Mm. He's a master's in law. Avi is brilliant in what I do, connecting people. Fundraising. He's been my right hand and he does much more than that, not just fundraising, but he's chairman and he does extraordinary work in that area. My other children, I have five additional children. Each of them is in their field, and each of them is in their work. Beautiful. And just in closing, uh, how can people learn more about Shalva? How can people visit Shalva if they want to come, they want to eat in the cafe, volunteer? Is it always open? Do you schedule? Do you tell, tell people a little bit about it? They can connect with this amazing place. Depending where you are, the best way to find information and contact information is to go to our website, www.shalva.org. Over there, you have the contact information to each of the different friends. So if you're in the States or Canada or in England, you can certainly contact those people. We are here at info at shalva.org. comes here. And uh, if you, the cafe is, you can phone in. There's a phone number, I'm sure, on the website. Uh, make your reservations. It is a place where I'm incredibly, you often do need reservations today. Right. But the partnership is key. There's no question that, you know, you asked how we do it. One by one, good angel, someone yeah. who hears your radio, says, you know what, I'd like to learn more, and learns more. And can people just come and show up, or do they, can they book a tour? How does that work? The tours have to be booked, because there's a lot of tours. Everyone's welcome to come to go to the cafe. The building is designed very carefully that the entrance floor and the floor above it where the cafe is are public areas, but you cannot move in the building without a security card beyond that because uh -huh. we have children. Sure. And the public is welcome, but only those who we know are there. Uh, so beyond that, yes, you do need to have a tour. And we, as much as we have people who work in that field, it, thank God, it's overwhelming. And I welcome, I look forward to meeting people and anyone who has an interest, I would be absolutely delighted to meet. As a matter of fact, you can contact me directly. I'm Kalman, K-A-L-M-A-N, at shalva.org. Kalman Samuels, founder and director of Shalva, along with his amazing wife, Malki, who we've heard so much about. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. 
This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews You Should Know.